So you you got in real trouble for stealing some yearbooks. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yes. The answer to that short answer, yes. I got in real trouble. They uh, a bunch got stolen. If anybody's listening, that went to Live Oak and was there in '99. Uh, I'll take a yearbook. Hey, I'll, I'll pay. I'll pay it forward. <laughs> My next guest on Soup with Coop is one of my favorite players to ever play. He's a trendsetter and he's a soup lover and he loves to give me a hard time. Jared Allen, welcome to Soup with Coop. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. I was just noticing though, like my homemade potato soup <laughs> is a little different than your tapioca potato soup. What, why, why? I mean, we haven't even, I haven't said a word and you're already calling me tapioca. <laughs> mm. I love potato soup. Did you, did I you actually offered it? I was going to make it pre, pre and freeze it and send it to you, you know, just so you could have the goodness and wholesomeness of a hearty homemade potato soup. Do, do people um, who grew up on horse farms tend to eat more soup than the, the average Joe? Probably. I'm a big soup guy. So I grew up like tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches, which I think is like, you know, probably one of the greatest meals of all time. I completely agree. I completely agree. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I think soup is one of those things. It's like casseroles, right? Where you can just kind of throw a bunch of stuff into a pot and it's delicious. You know, when I kind of was going through my notes on what we were talking about today, one word I thought would not come up was casseroles. And you've already, you know, already screwed up my whole interview process. I'm I'm totally rattled right now. My mom's from North Dakota. So (laughs) everything is a casserole in the Midwest, you know? I mean, it's like, oh, we're going to have steaks. Let's put it into a casserole. Let's throw some, you know, chicken down, casserole. Down here in New Orleans, I don't know if, they, if that's everywhere, but when when like an, an older couple, when, when the wife passes away and the man is eligible, he's 75, and they have these older women come and they bring casseroles to them. They call them the casserole queens, like they're trying to maybe, yeah. you know, look win for them over. two. Yeah, yeah kind of, win them over. I tell you, honest, me, casserole came about because people just didn't like leftovers. They just threw it all into a pot, <laughs> baked it with some cheese, and we're like, "This is this is awesome." Now, does your do your time in Idaho have a little bit of a special meaning because of potato today? Oh no, I didn't even think of that. Uh, <laughs> my kids actually, excuse me, I got a piece of bacon stuck in my throat. <laughs> ah, my kids, my kids love this recipe. Um, we do a lot of cooking in our family. Um, I recently started growing my own potatoes. These are not out of my garden, but I'm hoping my next batch will be straight out of the garden. But yeah, cold weather, I think cold weather lends to soups as well. Um, so probably the wrong time of the year to be making hearty potato soup, but is there really a wrong time of the year for it? No, I think you're right. Now, you mentioned you're growing things. Have you always had a, I don't know, a, a propensity to grow things, a green thumb? Are you handy in the garden? I do. I do have a green thumb. It doesn't, I can't say I, this is the more recent, you know, I started gardening, but my grandfather always had a massive garden. My dad has a big garden. So, um, I, I think, I think everybody's grandparents had like a big garden because that was just the thing to do. And I'm like my wife, same thing. Her, her grandparents had a big garden. And, uh, so yeah, I think as you get older, it's kind of the natural step in evolution of maturity is to grow your own food and, uh, garden. You know, that's funny. I have fond memories of my grandfather. He also, they teach you how to drive. Grandparents teach you how to drive well before, you know, it's like 11, mm-hmm. jump in the pickup truck and let's go check out my garden and go pick out <laughs> tomatoes and see what the heck's growing. It's like. <laughs> my grandpa hated the deer. So we, had, if, unless we were going number two, we had to go pee outside by the garden. We had to just mark the territory around. So you just have, it didn't matter what, it didn't matter boy or girl, grandkids, get out there and pee by the garden, pee around the perimeter. Jared, I cannot, I would love to know what my neighbors think of my family because I'll be in a tuxedo going to an event and I'll go outside and pee in the side yard as opposed to be inside. I mean, how redneck can a guy get? There's something good. There's just something about peeing outside, which is awesome. It, it is, especially after, you know, on a cold night with a little potato soup, maybe a few cold ones, and then just oh, yeah. let her fly. <laughs> just let it go. It just has freedom, right? You know, I remember we met for the first, well, I don't know if it's the first time, but we had a good, we sat next to each other on a flight not yep. not, not too long ago. And it's kind of interesting from a guy from the South, I have really no proper perspective. You know, when you say I'm from California, I have like a vision of how a California person is. He's either a surfer or kind of a dude, but to grow up on a 
horse ranch in California. I think I'm, I got to go to Ronald Reagan. It's the only person I think about, you know, California riding a horse. I think, and, and let me thank you for that. Cause I just arrived. I just got mentioned in the same breath as Ronald Reagan. So I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. Um, <laughs> trying to link so, two yeah, so legends. Cal- <laughs> California is a, is a weird dynamic. So you have the coastal cities, you have your big cities, everybody knows about, but you come on that like inside I five corridor there, it's all agriculture, actually big, you know, Bakersfield, all those areas are big, you know, cattle ranches and, and, you know, agricultural type places. So I was born in Texas, moved to California. I was to Northern California. My dad trained raining cut horses for about 35, 40 years. So I grew up on ranches kind of all over Northern California. Um, so yeah, I, I know people people look at you sometimes and you think, you know, like, well, besides, you know, LA, San Francisco, you know, Silicon right. Valley, you go, you can you get in, it's very, uh, very ag oriented. And then when you were growing up, it was probably even more so rural. But now, if you mention where you're from, it's one of the most wealthy, you know, it's Silicon Valley area now. It's it's wealthy of a place to live well, in people, the entire United think, States. Because I graduated because I graduated from Los Gatos. Yeah. They think like I was in Los Gatos. I was the very, very poor kid at Los Gatos. <laughs> my mom and stepdad, I lived with my dad down in Watsonville. Um, and if anybody doesn't know where Watsonville is at, well, just Google Watsonville and you'll understand why you don't know where it's at. And um, so I moved in with my mom and stepdad my senior year. That's how I ended up in Los Gatos. So people are like, Los Gatos, isn't that like the wealthiest like <laughs> you know, zip code in California? <laughs> like, no, it's not this guy. <laughs> Now you, you mentioned you were the the poor guy going there, and I I don't know how poor a guy has to be to be accused of stealing yearbooks. What in the hell were you going to do with yearbooks if you went, anybody wants to steal that yearbook? Was, that was what I mean, led me to Los Gatos, right? Like that was that live oak when I was in Morton Hill, and uh, we thought it was funny. We thought you know the football team and the seniors. We all thought it was hilarious. It turns out the school didn't think it was as funny as we did. <laughs> And I was already on an interdistrict, interdistrict transfer because my dad lived in Watsonville. And so they pulled my interdistrict transfer. It was either go to school in Watsonville, which nothing good comes from that, or uh, move up with my mom and stepdad. So you, you got in real trouble for stealing some yearbooks. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yes. The answer to that short answer, yes. I got in real trouble. They uh, A bunch got stolen. They tried to, they, they called the cops, tried to pin my, $3,500 worth of like stolen yearbooks on me. So, and then I refused to rat anybody out. And I was just like, you guys know, I didn't take them all. Like, it's just not physically possible for me to take them all. <laughs> like three of them, you could have them back. They already had like people with signatures. <laughs> so um, yeah, I was, you know, plus little- they were selling, you had to buy them for like 80 bucks. We were selling them for 40. So I figured like that was a much better deal. <laughs> For, I, was yeah. Yeah, I was really dying to know what the black market value is for yearbooks. I mean, it's funny the other day, my parents are moving out of their house and they have all these storage units. They call Peyton and they say, Peyton, I got all your stuff here. I'm talking yearbooks, your letters. You want it? He's like, yeah, you know, get it all together and I'll have someone come get it. And they call Eli. Say, Eli, what do you want to do with all your stuff? He goes, I don't care. Give it away. All my yearbooks. I don't give a crap. You know, some people get hit. They get sentimental about that stuff. Clearly. You're I, think, a- I wish I still had one. At least I didn't even get one. I, I didn't even, I didn't even get a yearbook out of the whole deal. I think that'd be funny so, for you to have to go back and buy a yearbook, you know, right now. I think it'd be good. If anybody's listening, I went to Live Oak and was there in uh, 99. I'll take a yearbook. Hey, <laughs> I'll pay, I'll pay it for it. <laughs> Football season is here and nothing beats seeing your favorite team live. Not only does Vivid Seats have great NFL ticket prices, they're also the official ticketing partner of ESPN. And with Vivid Seats rewards, when you buy 10 tickets, you get the 11th free. Download the app or visit vividseats.com today. Vivid Seats, life happens live. Receive a reward credit equal to the average price of 10 tickets purchased, excluding taxes, fees, and processing costs. See vividseats.com slash rewards for terms and conditions. Now, did you grow up? I mean, were you were you a country boy for all practical purposes growing up on a horse farm? Yes and no. So it's like when I was at home, full country boy, but being like a country kid wasn't cool back then, right? Jenkos were cool. I don't know why Jankos were cool, but they were cool. I don't know if they were cool in the South, but out West, Jankos were everything. What are the ones that would cover? What is a Jango? They were the, uh, 
they were the pant, right? These real big baggy pants that would cover your entire shoe. Oh yeah. So my dad would only buy me Wranglers. Like that's it. Anything outside of Wranglers, I'd like finagle my uh, finagle my mom to get them. So I would I would get to school, have like my two pairs of Jankos that I wear during the week. Right. Then I'd get back home and it was all Wranglers and boots. So I kind of I had to be a chameleon, you know, I had to fit in, <laughs> had to fit in at school. And then really only like my closest friends would come out to the house. My dad would put everybody to work. You know, when he came to the house, it was like, Hey, you got stalls to clean. Go get it done. You're like, dad, I'm not going to ever make any friends this way. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was one of those things where people were actually shocked when they'd come out and be like, Oh, you weren't kidding. Like you are <laughs> straight up cowboy yeah. on the ranch. But yeah, that's, that's what happens. I had to clean, I had to clean like 15, 20 stalls before I go to school. It was to the point like, I would, I would never take my shoes off at friend's house or I'd take my socks off as well. Cause like all my socks were stained from, you know, shoveling horse crap every morning. <laughs> so I, I just started watching uh, Yellowstone. I don't know if you watched it much. Mm -hmm. Could you have been a, a perfectly eligible guy to come, you know, work at the ranch and be a, a, a dude? hundred percent. So that's what my dad, like my dad trained reining horses and those, you know, horse scenes when they're sliding stops and doing all that stuff. That's what my dad trained reining, cutting, working cow horses. Um, but yeah, that's what I grew up doing. And how does so that open? I actually, I actually asked my publicist to try to get me on as an extra. I was like, I just want to be an extra on Yellowstone. Yeah. I just want to be one of the cowboys roping in the background. Like so cool. I, I can call Costner for you. I mean, I'm sure he'd yeah, you know, call. The Manning, the Manning family has some deep ties. You know what deep, I mean? <laughs> deep stroke. Deep stroke there. Um, now, were you always a big – I mean, you're 6'6". Six, six, you played at 6'6", six, six, what, 265 or so. Were you a big strapping buck? And do you accredit most of your strength and kind of uh, athletic ability to being around lifting things? No, I, so I was actually my sophomore year. I was only like five, five eleven, like one sixty, right, one fifty five. And then my junior year, I sprouted up to six three, two oh five. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I've never, I've never been like, a, I'm not busting out huge numbers in the weight room. Just been a hard worker. But yeah, I, mean, I guess you could say. I mean, I always, whenever the hay truck came, we always had to unload them. You know, um, that was always work to be done with the horses. So I don't know if that credited me anything, but. Uh, but yeah, I really didn't hit my my growth spurt until my junior year, and then my senior year I was six six, like two forty, and played most of my career at like two fifty five, two sixty. Did you love Did you love sports growing up? Everything Were you always outside? Oh yeah, so uh, <laughs> I quit playing. I was I loved baseball, baseball. I played baseball, basketball, everything, and then like in seventh grade, I was like only focusing on football. Decided like. Everything else has to go away. Football is where I'm going. And uh, I told my dad when I was eight, I was going to play professional football. And so I think ninth grade was like the last year I played basketball. And I was just, that's probably my only regret. Like, I wish I would have played baseball all the way through. I love, I love baseball. Really good at it. Uh, I just decided I'm going all in on football at an early age. I don't recommend that for people. It did work out, however. Yeah. It seems like everybody that, I mean, everybody has their regrets. I mean, I always wish. I always tell my kids, learn how to play the guitar. There's going to be, a, you know, a night when you're out in California at someone's horse ranch and there's going to be one guy, you know, playing guitar and there's going to be five girls looking at him and not even going to ignore you over there, you know. <laughs> So he's like, Dad, I think I'm starting to figure it out. I'm like, it's it's late, buddy. You're too yeah, late. Yeah, my kid could have at least forced me to play. Like, we, we, our, kids, our girls are playing the bay. Oldest plays the piano. My youngest will start. I remember that in college, too. Like, one of the one of our receivers dude just sat down he's like playing the piano and i'm like oh I was so jealous like to be <laughs> musically inclined i like i have no musical talent whatsoever and now that we live in nashville people was like oh are you a singer i was playing golf the other day this guy's like oh you're nashville are you a, are you a country singer <laughs> i was just laughing i was like no i am the least bit from that nash yeah you can go anywhere in nashville and there, I went and played golf over there, at Troubadour, one day. And, mm -hmm. you know, I look out, there's Darius Rucker, there's Eric Church, there's Morgan, there's, they got, it's like, you know, every, it's country, everybody. And then, and then I guess there's a million people there who are trying to make it, and those guys, you know, made it. But everybody in Nashville wants to be a country music singer, including me and you, which is not, it's not going to happen for us, I don't think. Yeah, no, no. I, I, there was like, oh, why'd you move out there? I'm like, 
just because <laughs> I really had no reason. No one told me how much it rained. So that was very disappointing. It's still very disappointing. I, like cry about missing the West like every day. <laughs> now, Jared, coming out of high school, what was what was recruiting like for you? I'm always curious, you know, how things have changed so well, much over the years. It was very, very good until the yearbook incident. So I had all plans of going to UW and playing in the Pac-10 and Every school came through my junior year and, you know, come, come watch and take my film. Then I went to Los Gatos and um, they found out about the whole yearbook debacle. And a lot of those opportunities went away and ended up at Idaho State. Uh, so it worked out well. But yeah, recruitment, yeah, it wasn't like it is today. There was no, you know, think about it, there was no Twitter, no, none of that. Like they just came out and basically, they basically told you, you need to come to our school. And you're like, all right, well, that was, that's, I guess that's the sales pitch. I mean, they're, you know, you're good enough to be here. You should be playing for us. There wasn't a whole lot of, you know, I got maybe get invited out to like a junior's day, you know, take your trips. And then, you know, all they, they give you what I think it was like $60 per diem when we went on our trips back in the day. And so you got as much beer as $60 could buy. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was it. That's right. I, I don't know. I there, was was no, there was none of this. There was none of this like, Oh, we are sponsored by Nike and we have this. They didn't even like hang our jerseys in the lockers when we got there. You know, it was just like. Oh, yeah. Now it's a full hey, gonna, photo yeah. shoots, everything. And, oh, yeah. they basically told you we're going to pay for your college and that's good enough for you to want to play for us. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, well what, I don't know a whole lot about Idaho State. Who was the who was the main rival of Idaho State and what was that experience like? Um. So I didn't know a lot about Idaho State either until I played there. I didn't know that place existed on earth. And um, yeah, I was just kind of like, wait, where where, are you, where am I going? And I, so I got to give credit to our head coach, Larry Lewis. So he was a Washington State guy. Half, like, most of our staff came from Washington State. And uh, and Coach Ball and, and then my D-line coach was going to be my D-line coach at Idaho State, Mark Ray. I mean, they were at my house like every every week during there, right? And they're like, oh, you know, so they, they sold me on the big fish, small pond thing and uh, well played to them. And But yeah, it was, I tell you what, our biggest rival was probably like Weber State, which is down in like Logan, Utah, which no one really knows about. Um, but it was it was an adjustment. Like I went, this, is, this was the difference from growing up in California. And when I went to Pocatello, Idaho, I had a you know digital cell phone. I had a little Nextel. Mm -hmm. And they he only had analog out there when I got there. So my digital cell phone did not work. I was like, what? Like, where am I right now? Where am I? And uh, I try to call it. It's just like, nope, you don't. Like, I'm like, this is ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was that's basically Pocatello. That was our rival. But it was great. We had, I swear, we were the uh, we were the school of like 1A misfits. So another one of our claim to fame. Adi Attar, who's famously now, you know, Conor McGregor's agent. He was my teammate out there. He played at UCLA. He got in trouble or something. He came. We had Daniel Pryor, who was an ASU, you know, full ride guy. <laughs> he came. Another guy named Eric Booz was at Washington State. Like, come on. Atari Callum, who was one of the greatest high school players in the history of California. He was at Cal and it was like something didn't work. Oh, we'll take you. We'll just, we'll take you. <laughs> So it was, it was fun. We had a lot of good competition and um, probably too much time on our hands because we all, we were all playing one double eight thinking we should have been, you know, all pack 12 or pack 10 or whatever it was back then. And then did you, what was the, the combine like, or how, when did you kind of sense, you know, NFL's a, a reality here and, and how am I going to stack up against these guys? Well, yeah. So I think, you know, I started getting accolades, you know, I think my sophomore year, um, I was on that like preseason all American team and all that stuff and, and going through, I always knew like long snapping, I was considered probably the best long snapper in the country. So I always knew like that was a, probably a surefire thing into the league. Um, but yeah, who, I guess my who junior year. To, Jared, Jared, who taught you how to long snap? Cause I think it's. Uh, my dad. He did. He yep. knew how my dad, when I was eight years old, taught me how to long snap. And it's a skill that was invaluable, honestly, going going all the way through Pop Warner, high school, college. Um, so, uh, although I always try to downplay it, like Fresno State, uh, I gave Pat, I saw Pat a couple years ago, I gave his proof, but I was like, hey, remember when you offered me a scholarship? 
and then told me you didn't want me to redshirt for the first year. All you wanted me to do is long snap. And I was like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah, I was probably stupid. That was probably dumb. Was. Um, but yeah, so long snapping was what really got people coming in. And then my senior year, I led the entire country in sacks. And, and so, and then you didn't help that, you know, I was in constant trouble throughout, you know, high school or college too. So that didn't help. You know, it was fun to explain to everybody, but, um, but yeah, so that, but the NFL was always in my mind. Like since I was a kid, there was nothing else I was going to do besides go to the NFL. Even in college, you know, my coach would be like, you have to go to school. And I'm like, yeah, we'll figure it out. I was a guy that like football season. I did, I did barely anything. And then I'd take like 18 credits the next semester I figured out the teachers didn't like summer school as much as we did. So I'd go to summer school and they'd be like, all right, just, we don't want to be here all day. A couple hours, you're gone. We're good. So I was like, yes, I found some loopholes to keep it going. But that was all I wanted to do. And then combine came out by the East West Shrine game. So got to go out there and compete against, you know, 1A guys. And that's what I kind of realized too. Like there's not much difference, right? Like for me, it's always been attitude in, in my mindset to be, want to be the greatest, want to be the best. And um, so got through that. The combine was a little nerve wracking because, you know, they, you get there and it's like right off the plane, Cybex testing, wake you up at five in the morning to sit in a room for five hours and you know, do physicals. Then they throw you on in. Like, I'm not a bench presser. Like, remember I mentioned earlier, not killing it in the weight room. <laughs> then they throw you in a, they throw you, first of all, you do the cattle auction with your shirt off and they're like pinching you and calling out your, your, body fat you know, like you're just I'm like i feel like i'm in the meat market right now you know what i mean I, I know what it is to be on an auction block at the cattle market right now this is ridiculous and uh so then you go right from there and i had to go in and lift put 225 on and they got like stadium seating in there and there's one bench with like a spotlight on it and this is my worst nightmare i'm doing 225 maybe 15 times right i think my mat i did like 18 in practice I got to 13 and my arms went jello and I just got <laughs> the way I was like, that's it. It's done. So I'm like, hopefully my film is good enough. And uh, yeah, that was my combine experience. <laughs> yeah. I never, you know, I never had you notched in there as a, as a rule follower. You kinda, you kinda... Yeah. I mean, I mean I... <laughs> something about the hair, yeah. but we, uh, but anyway, I ran, I ran well to combine. So that's what, that's what made everybody that I snapped well. And uh, so that was on, on the list, but my, so fit Larry Fitzgerald, I, you know, he's an Arizona guy. I, I used to live in Arizona as well. So we became good buds, but he was there and his, my roommate at the combine was Chris Wilson, which we ended up getting drafted to the same. We both got drafted to the chiefs, but you know, he was teammates with Larry in, in high school. And so Larry obviously didn't have to do anything. You know, he's a top three pick. And so he would come into our, room like every morning and jumping on the bed i had no clue i wanted to haymaker this dude in the face and i'm like this is this means something for me okay like we all know who you are you don't even know my name right now so i need you to let me sleep but yeah 5 30 every morning i'm jumping in on our bed i was just like oh i want to strangle this dude <laughs> but yeah, yeah. i all worked out larry for sure one of the great have you ever played golf with larry i have so larry used to be very very bad at golf and now he became pretty good at golf. He can hit. He can hit a golf yeah. ball as far as anybody. I mean, I mean, yeah. it's, it's insane how hard. He put some time. I, although I was wondering, I'm like, where are you finding this much time? All right. So he's got he's got a pretty sweet deal there in Arizona. I think he golfs more than he's forced to practice. Which hey, I get. It. You guys done everything. <laughs> Quarterback specialist and Larry Fitzgerald are like <laughs> you know the the rule breakers when it comes to golf. Yeah, I think if Larry could deep snap, he'd still be playing, probably. Probably, yeah. Well, yeah, he's probably just holding out so they give him like another thirty million just to come back for a season. Let's t speak. I mean, when you mentioned Larry, you think about, you talk about great hair. Your hair has a whole podcast you know, <laughs> dedicated to it in itself. We're going to run out of time, I know. But when did you start really kind of you know setting the trend on on being a little different upstairs? So. I was in Kansas City. I was back in Arizona. Um, I was with one of my dear friends, a financial guy, Jeff White. And his wife gave me his ASU like ID photo. And it looked like um, Peter Griffin with a mullet, right? <laughs> and I was just like, oh, yes. Like, oh, this is amazing. Like, how do you not have your hair like this still? So we decided, we, we were like, all right, from this point forward till tax day, 
five thousand dollars to whoever has the best mullet. By you know, so it was just it was just a simple bet. Then this is going through the season, everything's going. And you know, I, I remember when I first first cut my hair into it too. I was like, so you're in those awkward stages. I'm like, all right, I got to commit to this. I got to cut the mullet, and I cut it, and it was like people responded to it. And I was like, this is this is amazing. And then went out, had a great. Great, I was having a great season, and next thing you know, there was like mullet wigs in the in the stadium. And then Dustin Colquitt came up with the idea of putting a racing stripe in there for every sack I got that year, uh, and it just kind of became this team, this team deal. I remember I was I was kind of having like a Britney moment where I was like, I'm just done with my hair, I'm going to shave it off. And you know, like someone texted me like, "Where are you at?" And I was like, "I'm at the barber." And they're like, "You better not be cutting your hair, like freaking." <laughs> I was like, all right, all right. scrap that just just tighten it up a little bit um so yeah it really started as a bet and then it just kind of became its own little thing and and honestly it was, then i was like oh this is awesome and it really took away from like my ugliness of my face so that was nice and uh yeah it just it worked out well for me <laughs> you know i don't know it's taken a little while but I, they're the mullet is back it's 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 a little more almost mainstream well, see they're calling it they're calling it a hockey cut now i was at the barber uh but last year, and they're like, "Oh, you want you want a hockey cut?" And I was like, well, "We call those a mullet, right?" So I was like, "Sure." So they're calling them hockey cuts now. Gardner, I think Gardner Minshew has been out on, uh, you know. Although the only thing I'm a little upset about, like, you have to give homage to the guys before you, right? So like, yeah. In his in his post, he really didn't mention Gastineau, Bosworth, or myself. And it's like you, you can even throw Billy Ray Cyrus in there, right? You gotta. You gotta you gotta list the guys that have done it before you because I mean, we're proud you're rocking it and the stash was great, but you always have to give homage to those who come before you. I think you're dead right there. If you're just gonna ignore, pretend like you're the first guy to do it, it's this. Yeah, like, no, I didn't invent this haircut. Like it came. It, like <laughs> there was way more. It's just like the rat tail, you know. Like that, the mullet probably evolved from the rat tail. So someone, someone like you know. Billy Ray Cyrus is going to have to give credit to, you know, I don't even know. I don't even know who had the rat tail, but somebody else probably did. <laughs> now, Jerry, in, you know, in the middle of your career, you get traded to Minnesota and kind of the opposite of a country boy from California is a country boy from Mississippi and your teammates with Brett Favre, who's he's, you know, wearing Wranglers, you know, doing Wrangler commercials. And you, you have, I mean, you've worn Wranglers before, but then you also got to debut what you you know a little a little shorter version of those jeans sure, my, yeah my the, the the jorts or that is just a, that's an added progression that came with the hair you know um and i gotta be honest again i can't take credit most of my good ideas come from something i've seen or i've heard and i'm just have i just have the wherewithal to you know put it into action so i i grew up you know water skiing too i right? love love water skiing we surf on the lake now but the guy I used to water ski with and taught me how to drive boats and, and taught me how to water ski was it was a legit slalom skier. And he was the guy that was out there and cut off shorts, right? Just shredding. And you know, it's like if you, if you snow ski or anything too, you get to the mountain and you see the guy with like the just bright yellow orange jacket with jeans. You're like, he has no intention of falling. He had yeah. this dude has no, he's just going to shred it up. And that's what he was. And so, once I got to the point with my hair in the comments, I'm like, the jorts is just the next progression of, you know, exuding awesomeness and letting people know how confident <laughs> I am in myself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Brett, Brett, Brett fell right in that category. You know, he came in and Kenny Mason was like, Brett, let me show you the proper way to wear Wranglers. <laughs> exuding awesomeness is, I would say, the theme of this entire interview. Um, Joe, when you were playing though, you, you're obviously always in the thick of either leading the league in sacks or right there in the hunt, you know, making all pro going to pro bowls who it's always fun to, you know, hear who a great player has a lot of respect for who on the, on the tackle side, did you <clears throat> really have to study for and get ready for? So I had the, I, I, it's a pleasure now as a displeasure when I started to play with Willie Rofe, right? So when I came in the league, Willie Rofe. In my opinion, you know, some people can argue, but in my opinion, I think Willie Rofe is probably the greatest offensive tackle to ever play the game. Um, and he just, he taught me so much because, I mean, I, I had to work every single day against him and try to figure out how to beat him. And I figured if I could figure out how to beat him, I could beat pretty much anybody. But guys I had trouble with were 
or those those big athletes, like guys who won't give me your hands but can absorb more. So like Walter Jones, obviously Walter Jones right up there. You know, he, he could arguably be one of the greatest as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so Walter Jones was really tough. I only got to play against Jonathan Ogden once, uh, but he's that – He that was a tough – the whole system was tough. Their three-step drop, you know, he just – he just sits there and lets you come in and give you the big bear hug. Yeah. Uh, so guys like that, Joe, Th- probably in the modern era, like more or I should say later in my career, Joe Thomas was, was one of those guys who was, was, was pretty athletic enough to recover. Um, so those would probably be my, my hand set of three right there. Those, those are all hall of famers. So I'm glad to know yeah. you're going to get brutal. Uh, you really I'll, a quick, funny story about Willie. I'll cliff note it, but this is when I knew I had to make him my best friend. So, this was my, uh, I guess it was my rookie year. We were, we were doing a half line drill and I tee off. I hit him in the chin and I lock him out. Craig Wesley comes down, hits Priest Holmes. Coach for meal flips out, right? Like nobody touches Priest Tom. They're not, you have, you have Willie, Brian Waters, Casey Wickman, right? And then so he makes us do it again. So I hit Willie as hard as I could again, try to lock him out. But for some reason, I couldn't understand why I was going backwards. Willie had hit, lifted me up off the ground. Like I was on my tiptoes running backwards, dumps me on my head. And this is when I was like 275 and spears me in my back as I try to get up. And I was like, that, that dude's a lot better than me. And I need to figure this game out real quick or that's going to be, that's going to be my, uh, my polite life. So, uh, yeah. So I credit Willie for embarrassing me and making me really fine tune my craft. No, I would think that's got to be one of the greatest things ever to be a young guy coming in and getting to play every day against arguably the best left tackle ever. I mean, you're only going to get better. Or are you going to quit? I mean, he's either gonna- yeah, it's one, of, it's one of the two. And I'm sure he hated it because here I'm the guy trying to earn a starting spot. And he's probably thinking like, with this fourth round pick, just give it up already. I was like Rudy Rudiger out there just in, in training camp, running into brick walls. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you were back then what you would call now a high motor guy, right? I mean, well, you're a high motor every, guy yeah. until you get good, right? High, high, well, high effort, yeah, high energy, high motor. Um, you know, I'm like, I was a technician as well and sneaky athletic, but we'll just forget about that part. High, high effort guy, you know, he's got, that guy's got the motor. Um, yeah, I, I came from a coach that told me one time, he's like, you'll make way more plays the more you're around the football, right? So just put yourself around the football. And you can make way more plays. And I think that's something, you know, a lot of top guys miss out on, right? When you see bust in the NFL is they, they rely solely on their athletic ability and talent. They forget when you get in the NFL, everybody's athletic, everybody's strong, everybody's fast. Everybody has a skill set. So it's the, it's the little things like, you know, if I run the ball more faster than everybody else, I have a chance, a ball pops out, I have a chance to get it. So half of that was just me just putting myself around the pile, putting myself in the action and good things happen. And Jared, you were always um, on the field, obviously all business and ready to get after it and, you know, going hundred miles an hour, but always managed to have a lot of fun a- as well. H- how did you balance that? And then do you think there's enough of that? Do you think people are having too much fun or all business? H- how did you, you know, know that coaches took you seriously? Cause I know you're, you know, messing around so on me, Tuesdays. Was, for me, I think I was all at my best when I was having fun, right? If, if, if it became work and then you're just, your mind's too, you're too, you're too focused on it. And uh, I think the coaches knew me. They, they saw how I worked during the week. They saw how I prepared. Um, then, I mean, I was very vocal about how much I, I hate losing. I think everybody, anybody ever played with me knows I despise losing. Um, but yeah, so I think it's a balance. It, it has to be authentic though, right? So I think some of these celebrations today are great, but it's too rehearsed. And I'm like, how much time are you guys working on this in practice, right? I like to see spontaneous, you know, stuff with just spontaneous emotion. I think that's why people were drawn to Brett as well, right? Brett played with a raw emotion. And for me, that was just how I always grew up playing. That's when I was at my best, when I was having fun in that moment. So I think it is a balance. And I think everybody has to figure out what that balance is for them, right? If it's if it's crazy focus, let that guy be crazy focused, super intense. For me, it, you have to be loose because especially on the defensive side, it's all reaction based, right? I mean, I don't know what, I don't know the count. I don't know anything. So I can go through my keys and read, but I have to be able to react and I have to be able to kind of flow with, with where the game is going. So, um, but speaking of having fun, I'm probably sure you sure I told you my dog's barking at me to get out. No, that's fine. Um, but my very first start was against your brother, Peyton. And it was on Halloween. <laughs> it was on Halloween. And the day before I had uh, come dressed as Michael Phelps, right? 
Speedo, 2000, that was 2004, right? So full <laughs> Speedo, USA swim cap, six gold medals, show up late to uh, to a team meeting on purpose, and, and we all had a blast with it. Well, then the vets were like, oh, you're wearing that to the game. I'm like, no, like, it's, it's my first, like, first of all, it's my first start. I'm not wearing this to the game. So I made, I made, I made, I made a deal with them. I said, if we win, I'll wear this, I'll wear this out, right? So sure enough, we win. I'm putting my Speedo, everybody's got their suits on. I'm putting my Speedo swim cap on. Go, Lamar Hunt is looking at me like I'm absolutely crazy. He comes up and gives me this barrel chested hug. I just got, you know, all his head in my chest. Walk out the door and your brother is doing an interview right outside. And it, old Arrowhead, you know, you walked right kind of, the, the locker room was kind of just, you did all your interviews in the hallway. And he was right there. And he kind of glanced at me like, who, I mean, he, doesn't, he obviously didn't even know my name at the time, probably, right? I mean, I, I did hit him a bunch that game. I didn't sack, but I didn't hit him a bunch. But I walked by him and gave him the old good game on the backside. <laughs> and his face was just kind of like, who is this human being right now? So that was my uh, that was my first interaction with your brother. And I uh, he got the last laugh. They, my first start and last start was against the Manning. And he won the Super Bowl. Dang, I won the first one. He won the last one. Go figure. Hey, hey, yeah, everybody. I, I, have, <laughs> I remember those games in Kansas City. That play, that play, you know, that's an old school spot where everybody, I mean, they have buses. Everybody's wearing like almost letter jackets. The fan yeah. base there is fantastic. It's loud. And it's, they're, they're you know, quiet when the offense is in, in motion. And then so loud. I was at that game when no one punted. Yeah, that was the year, that was the year before I died. That was the playoff game, right? Yeah. No, yeah, that was that was crazy one. Um, yeah, Kansas City was a, was a place that um, is is insane. You know what I mean? It's just like you drive in and you just smell football. It's just barbecue central. There's there's something about that atmosphere that is that is it's nostalgic. You're like, we, we didn't matter how cold it is, you just roll your windows down and uh, and just sit there and just take it in. You knew it was game day. Jared, let me have one more bite of soup. As always, we like to grade it out. Between one and a thousand. So you're making your own soup. I imagine you're probably going to give it a pretty high grade. Yeah, my, I, I, even had to improv, I had to improvise a little bit because I ran out of milk. So I had to use a little heavy cream, you know, broth mixture substitute. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm going to give mine a, a strong, like, 998. There's always room for improvement. Always room for improvement. <laughs> All right, people, we're brought to you by Caesars Sportsbook, the greatest sports betting app of all time. See, it's not just about the daily promos, odd boosts, or the hundreds of ways to wager. It's about the immortal words of Caesar himself. You bet, you get with Caesars Rewards. Every bet you place on the app, no matter the outcome, earns towards exclusive perks at Caesars Rewards destinations everywhere. Hotel stays, concert tickets, bonuses, and more. Download the Caesars Caesars Sportsbook app, become a Caesars Rewards member today and get more with every wager. Must be 21 or older to gamble. Gambling problem? Call or text 1-800-522-4700. All right, one thing we're going to try, we've never done this before, but we're going to try, is I'm going to say <clears throat> two true statements and one false statement in no order. These are going to be jumbled just to right. kind of rattle you. And you tell me which one you thinks or think are legit and or false. So um, I can let you know, in high school, I had a mullet. I also, right now, and if you went upstairs in my closet, I have a pair of jorts. And I uh, have never ridden a horse, but I have ridden a Shetland pony. Which one of those are true and oh. false? Oh, see, that last one threw me off. I thought I had it, had it known. I'm going to say, well, you're from Louisiana, so you for sure had a mullet in high school. That's just <laughs> absolutely happened. <laughs> yes. um, the George I was going to say was, was the lie until the horse thing came through, and you threw in Shetland Pony, which kind of makes me feel like someone told you this was a Shetland Pony you were riding. So I'm going to go with... <laughs> Shelling Pony is the truth and George is the lie. <laughs> what am I riding right here? I don't know what I'm on. You're on a Shetland Pony. Oh, great. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, you have, you're very wise. Also, I didn't even include that, but I dressed one time as Mark Spitz 
at a Halloween Ooh, costume. Yes. yes. It was a party, and the lady, the girl that was having her birthday was name was Suzanne. So everybody had to dress as something that started with the later letter S. This is pre Phelps. Pre Phelps. Yeah. So I wore this spitz. I wore just a speedo, some fake. Yeah. Put an entire black wig in my, uh, you know, in my speedo, and uh, I, I, I won first place. You know, it was good. So. Oh, that's 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 amazing. I knew we were kindred spirits right there. So you know, <laughs> we go way back. Absolutely. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Do you have, do you have do you have any lies and truths you want to share with me off the top of your oh, head? Oh, I guess I can. Let me let me think about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, who? Let me uh, let me run this down here. Not a very good liar. Uh, okay. Truth. All right. I'm not going to tell you the truth. No particular okay. order. So, all right. I have, I have hit myself in the face with a hay hook. <laughs> I broke my nose by being hit in the face by a cleat from a coach. <laughs> and I have water skied with a smiley face drawn on my but I, I'm going all three are true. They are. They are. You're not a very good liar. I was like, you're a liar. I threw you going to say naked, and I was like, crap, I actually did that. So, Jared, you've been a pro. I really appreciate you being on the show, and uh, I hope to see you soon, my friend. Oh, my pleasure. Always good to see you. Take care.